Yo, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, wait, perfect. All right. And we are back between Tiennes. It is Friday night at the Q Bar, and it is Cinco de Mayo. And we are with Billy Smith. How are you doing, sir? Good. Uh, I'm Lee. I, know, I remember you. You do remember me. Yeah, it's the hair. You. Everyone kind of like... Uh, well, you, come on, you're showing off. You're not... <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a low blow. Oh, that's a low blow. Me. I'm sorry. I mean, right? The first thing in an interview, you insult me. I, I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have a drink now. Oh, go so, ahead. <laughs> everyone in the industry knows you. For oh, hopefully. One reason or another. Uh, right. You, you, you really it's just do. longevity. If you hear long enough, they all know you. Yeah. How? When? How did you get into? We got dancing? into it very easily. We, we, we. I mean, my background was. We had a family business of uh, Stevedore and Tugs in the uh, Port of New Orleans. Very big okay. company. We sold that back in the 80s. But we grew up fishing and sailing at Southern Yacht your, Club. This is the Smith family? This is the Smith family. So we grew up sailing and fishing at Southern Yacht Club in New Orleans. And um, one of my friends was John Dane, who uh, ended up working at Halta Marine. And Halta Marine at the time, in the mid, early mid-70s, was the... He was like the domin of the U.S. He had eight shipyards. He had 70% of the supply boat business in the U.S., 50% of the tugboat business in the U.S. He was very big. This is back in the 80s? This is back in the 70s. And in the 80s, he sold out to Trinity Industries in Texas. And in right. the 80s, Trinity Industry bought John Dane Shipyard. So we sold our family business in the early 80s. And John comes to me in the late 80s and says, look, um, we need to, you know, we need some help. We've got, we're down to two shipyards, three shipyards out of eight. We've got to find some other markets. So they were building aluminum crew boats and aluminum patrol boats. And we did some market research. What markets are using aluminum? Fast ferries and yachts came up. And um, we took a look at Broadwoods and we took a look at burgers and we, we said, okay, well, they're not even built into class, which we found shocking. So we decided, well, let's try the yacht business. And um, only because the welders, we had, we had very good workers in the, the New Orleans shipyard. But if we were trying to build commercial boats out of that yard, we were the high cost producer, had a lot of overhead. But if we took that same labor and started building yachts and competed against Fort Lauderdale or Europe, all of a sudden, we were a low-cost low producer. Huh. Same labor, same skill set, just a different market. So that's how we got into the yacht business. Good God. <laughs> Wasn't real complicated. No, not really, is it? If you can well, the, the, the only thing that we really missed, we, we just thought the old saying about if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door, which is not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not if they don't know you're building a better mousetrap and not if they don't know where the door is. So we, we kind of miss those two things. That's marketing. And we didn't understand that the yacht market is all about pedigree. Okay, much, pedigree is much more important than what Which you're America building. America doesn't really have a lot of. No, it doesn't have a lot of. The, the, the Dutch and the Germans are very proud to point that yeah. out. Very, and the Italians. And, no, not the Italians, but the Dutch and the Germans <laughs> will, really, will really beat you up on that. Because they beat the Italians up on it, too. So, well, yeah. <laughs> so we, you know, we just say, well, we go ask the Italians and tell us how they feel. Um, but we, 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 we misunderstood. We were very successful commercial and military boats, but those are very objective markets. How fast you go, what guns you carry. You know, uh, how big are you? How many tons of cargo can you carry? And then what is the price? And you can associate some value based on the performance of the vessel and the price. So that's very objective. So it's just basically a paperwork thing. Did well, in the yacht market, is very subjective. Okay? Yeah. It's like, oh, well, that's too close to the Dutch yard or that's too close to the German yard. In terms it doesn't of matter if it's a better boat in terms of price. You know, you come up with a price and before they even look at the performance or the quality, they're automatically associating it with a Dutch or German or now Italians. And the Americans are not allowed to be 
anywhere right. near their price. Now, why is that? <clears throat> well, it's a pedigree. It's a perceived. It's the perceived pedigree, and it's the perceived value. Okay. The the easiest thing is is I always say you know it, when you're in the luxury goods market. Okay. Does anybody buy a Rolex to tell time? Yeah. If you just want to tell time, you can do the Timex, the Casio. You can look at your iPhone, okay? So the Rolex is a piece of jewelry. It's a luxury item that happens to tell time. And for a lot of these yacht owners, their yacht is a luxury good. It's a luxury item that happens to float, and you can happen to stay on it. But it's that, it's that perception of value, whether it's real or not, doesn't matter. If the client thinks it's there's no value, he's not going to buy it. If he thinks there's value, he will buy it. So it takes a while in, in the luxury goods market to develop your pedigree and your reputation. Why doesn't America have a luxury car company? Because they've made the decision they don't want one. Correct. Because I think that's what makes America great. It's well, not necessary. I mean, let's look at what Henry Ford did back in the 60s when he decided, you know, he wanted to build a sports car that could win Le Mans. And he won it three years in a row with the GT40 and promptly shut the program down. And I've did, done that now. Yeah, did that. <laughs> been there, done that. Didn't even capitalize on it. You know, mm. he proved he could do it, but he didn't capitalize on it. I mean, does anybody really think that the U.S. cannot do anything they put their mind to? No, but that's what, that's what I find so, amazing. Right. So when Why you, doesn't it? And because, it's because it's usually management driven. It's not, it's not because the workers can't do it. It's not because the engineers can't do it or the scientists. Or the, it's usually it's a management decision that Based we're just not going to do that. Yeah, we're not going to do that. Mm. In our case, <clears throat> there's no trinity anymore because of mismanagement. But in our case, we were able to slowly build the brand up as the owners were willing to give us more money. So at first, we had to be really inexpensive. And they'd see that and they'd say, wow, that, that was good. Well, give us some more money. We can do even better. And then eventually, you, you finally, towards the end, we had, we had owners that were not talking to any other yard. They would just simply, this is what I want. And I want this to be this and that. And you know, the, the, the workers certainly could perform. What was it was always first? being held back by budgets and, and management and clients. What was that first Trinity like? Well, she's still around. The first Trinity, again, we didn't want to be, uh, the, the, you know, we didn't want to compete against the Americans. We wanted to compete against the Europeans. So the very first Trinity was a Gerhard Gil Gilgenes design. She was a 30 meter boat, 31 meters. She was a, the same group that had done Azura. It was a Gerhard Gilgenes design. This is design. definitely before my time. <laughs> it, uh, that's right. This is late 80s. It was a Gerhard Gilgenes design. It was a Paula Smith interior. And Michael Philpott was the owner's rep. And um, Joe Smullen did all the acoustic engineering. And she, was, she had fresh air makeup. She was deadly quiet. She was so far beyond uh, anything that was available in the market at that time. Um, but because we didn't do any marketing or advertising, nobody knew we'd built this great boat. I mean, some people knew it, but it was just... But when they asked, well, what's the price of the boat? And you tell them how much it really costs, they were shocked. Well, they were comparing apples and oranges. Yeah. You know, you know go, go take these specifications and go ask these yards to build it and then see what our price looks like. Because at one time, you were the world's largest yeah. CPOP builder. Yeah, uh, a couple of years. Uh, two years, I think. And you were cranking what? One out every... At our peak, uh, when, the, when the financial collapse, well, when the recession hit back in 08, yep. at the Monaco show, when I think it was uh, Lehman Brothers, whoever failed, we, um, at that point... We had 24 yachts on order uh, at an average length of about 100 and uh, average length of about uh, 55 meters. And so, everyone just no, actually, uh, out of out of those 24 vessels, only two were not delivered. We had two guys default. All the rest of them we delivered, but we weren't getting any new orders. So once yeah. we ate through that backlog, uh, the decision was made to go after commercial military boats again. 
and uh, the, the real demise of Trinity, aside from you know, getting away from the yacht market, we should have just, okay, if there's no new orders for boats, we should have gone into repair and refit and take care of the 60 boats that we had out there. And we could have kept the yard going. Yeah, you could have just done refits. Right. Yeah. We went after the, uh, we, we built the first LNG powered vessels in the U.S. Really? And these were 92 meter uh, offshore supply vessels. And uh, we had a contract for six of those. And these were ABS Passport Green, these were diesel electric, these were dual fuel LNG diesel. They were, um, they were so sophisticated and we were just losing so much money per boat. It was basically the client for the, the, the our client that ordered the boats ended up owning the yard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, shame on us. Well, now it's interesting what David is just saying. He said, Burger, they didn't make much money because you're building boats and it's not a, there isn't that a lot of profit there once things start getting underway? Well, it, I mean, come on. A anybody that's, you, it's somebody asked us one time, do you guys, with all these casinos in Louisiana, do y'all gamble? And we said, yeah, we gamble every time we sign a contract. Because we're basically betting that we can build the boat for less than we just sold it. Okay, you win that. <laughs> Is that really the way you treated it? Yeah, you win that bet sometimes, sometimes you lose. Sometimes there are things out of your control. Um, but, you know, by building multiple boats, you know, you eventually, you, you develop your, your cost returns, your estimators get better, your, your procedures and policies get better. And as your pedigree increases, yes, you can make good money. So now you're a yacht broker? Well, yes. Well, I'm brokering and I'm, I'm, the intent is to try and get Marine Max, which is the world's largest retailer of boats, to hang on to their clients and take them into the super yacht uh, area. Oh, okay. So Instead of letting them just walk away, you, you get them up to 100 feet or to 120 yeah, feet. Instead of just letting them walk away, let's hang on to them. And um, okay, you ready for a custom boat? Do you want a, a used boat? You want a new boat? You want a used boat? Let's sit down. We'll go look at some boats, some good ones. Uh, if you want to build, we'll take you to some of the yards, um, depending upon what kind of boat you want to build and what size you want to build, and what your budget is. You know, we can make it a lot easier for these owners to acquire yeah, it's, a boat. It's actually quite right. You know, you, you, a lot of these boats. This is actually one question I was having with my um, girlfriend. Girlfriend. <laughs> well, that, that's you know. Why? When we get into personal <laughs> relationships, that's a change order. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, we were saying about... Hang on, I completely lost my train of thought then. What was I saying? Your girlfriend. No, wife. yeah, wife. <laughs> what, no, wife? <laughs> okay, well, you that's may want to edit that girlfriend stuff out of there, okay? Just, uh, a, just a tip. Talking about... Walking so the like, clients into... No, 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 Reva. Yeah. So, Reva okay. used to make, the, still do, the most beautiful little yeah. 30, 40 foot boat. Yeah. Should they have stopped at 30, 40 foot? Well, it depends. I mean, some people have successfully, you know, started small and just continually grown with their clients. As their clients come back and they say, well, that was, you know, I love my 40 footer, but can you build me a 60 footer? And, you know, they remember, to, to Bertram that. used to build 20 foot boats, Hatters used to build a 28 foot boat. <laughs> and they don't do that anymore because they've grown up with their clients. So you've seen you've seen hmm. companies that have grown with their clients. You've seen other companies that have taken their, their eye off the ball and, and fallen apart. And then you see some companies that this is what we do. This is all we do. And we do. If really you well. want something else, go you know go go have it. All right. So you, why did you choose Marine Max? I chose Marine Max because um, I was friends with the um, with the upper management, and uh, I, I liked what they were doing. I, it was totally foreign to what we did. I mean, we only built two order, and we built custom. Marine Max has much more of the. We have a lot of inventory, and whatever you want, we usually have it somewhere, and we can give it to you right now. Still azimuth, right? Or did, was Marine that? Max is the world's largest dealers for azimuth for Sea Ray, for Grady White, for Boston Whaler, for Galleon, for Hatteras, Scout. Basically any brand that Marine Max takes on, they will be the world's largest dealer in that brand. Yeah. 
They do, they do close to a billion dollars a year in sales. Yeah, you see, Billy doesn't do things, small things. You know? <laughs> I, well, I just thought, I, you know, it's not really worked out the way I thought it would um, for a lot of reasons. But I was really intrigued by the idea that you get got this massive pool of existing owners. Yeah. All right, you already have a boat. How many owners do they have? Tens of thousands. thousands. They, you know, they. I don't. I think they sell fifteen hundred boats a year, or whatever. So they've got thousands of owners. Yeah. So okay, let's take the top. You know, what let's go call this database and yeah. say, okay, give me every uh, guy in the database that has a net worth of a quarter billion or half a billion dollars. Okay, and then let's go sit down with this guy or this girl, woman, and say. All right, you love boats, and you've got the money, so what's keeping you from a bigger boat? And normally, they, they're not comfortable, they don't, they don't know anything about bigger boats, or they just don't know where to find crew, or they don't have the time to build a boat, or they don't have the time to manage a boat. Mm. And, but there's barriers that are, you know, that they're stopping at 60 or 70, 100 feet. And it's, it's making that jump from owner-operator to fully crewed uh, yacht is a big jump for them. And a lot, of, a lot of them are just uncomfortable. Do you think, the, so, um, do you know AJ Anderson? Yes. So AJ's just sold a boat to uh, a guy. Um, first boat ever. Yeah. 90 meters. Yeah. Done. That's your first boat. Right. Do you think that's right? Oh, I know it's not wrong, but is it? What's the well, best? Well, no. Way? It's 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 okay if this guy has a guy like AJ running an interference farm. Okay. True. Okay. Because AJ knows that market. Okay. AJ knows where to find crew. AJ knows how to properly run a boat. AJ knows what a refit should cost. AJ knows what a real operating budget on this boat should be. Okay. All the all the stuff that this so young owner and I'm taking yeah. he's young. All the stuff that this owner doesn't know, AJ does know. And so AJ has done a great job, obviously, of eliminating the barriers. And, and in a lot of cases, protecting the guy against himself or from himself. You know what you were saying? Um, that was given an example of the typical boat owner in America. Mm -hmm. Their mom and pop, they had a few pharmacy, co uh, few pharmacy chains in the Midwest. They sold out, $10 million payout. They bought the big house at the big swinging dicks in town. Mm -hmm. They go, right, let's go and buy a boat. Right. They come down to South Florida. They realize how expensive a boat really is. They get a <laughs> second-hand one. After two years, they're done with all the maintenance and problems, yeah. and they're out of the industry. Well, and again, that's, you know, so it's not enough... And the reason we bought IYC yes. back in the day was back because it, it's not enough anymore to build a great boat, okay? If the guy's got a really good captain and good management and everything else, then your, your job's done. You've built him a good boat, and it's turned over to really good people, and they're going to make sure he has a good, the owner is going to have a good experience. We had a lot of owners that were not experiencing that, okay? So... When we acquired IYC, one of the real areas of interest was the yacht management. That, you know, look, you know, you're new to this. I mean, the guy that bought Rockstar, he bought it secondhand, first boat he ever bought, and that's 161 feet, okay? We spent more time with him on budgets and management than the actual acquisition of the boat, okay? And he never would have bought that boat without management, okay? So. And the yacht management is not, you know, to, um, you know, so much look over the captain's shoulder. There's so much paperwork these days with MCA and chartering and everything that the management should, a good management company should take a lot of the burden off that captain and allow the captain to do what, he's, what he really was trained at and is good at, which is mm -hmm. running that boat and keeping the owner happy. Was Rockstar the one the bridge fell yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he was happy at that point. He had bought a uh, Trinity and not a uh, plastic boat. <laughs> it, the bridge fell on him, yeah. Yeah, the bridge fell on him. Well, here in Lauderdale. You can see it on YouTube. Yeah. The boat was under tow because he wanted to make Art Basel. And uh, something about the crew and everything, and the boat wasn't able to, the captain didn't have his paperwork in straight. And he says, just tow it. So they had a whole gang of people working on the boat, and they were towing it through a Basco bridge. 
and one half stayed up and the other half the brake let go and it slowly came down as the boat was being towed through and it landed on the on the uh, hard top in the uh, flybridge, a uh, sun deck. But the boat's fine? Boat's fine. It was a little bit lower in the water, supporting that bridge. <laughs> Made all the news and everything. It's on YouTube. I can't believe I missed that. Yeah, it's on YouTube. It just came out of a massive refit. Yeah, just came out a lot of them. We refit one not even finish, and, and he said, I, no, I, it has to be at Art Basel. So that's the reason she was on the tow, because they hadn't reconnected a lot of stuff, apparently, and, 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 and it was the captain's first day on the job. So. They left the yard, got here, back by the afternoon. But the boat just stopped when that bridge, when that bridge went down on it. Blimey. So, Have you got any other funny stories like that? I mean, oh, there's, there's tons. we've been very serious in this. No, interview. there's tons of uh, interesting stories. But I know um, guns and military supplies and anti-tank missiles and oh, stuff like that. Was back in the day was gun safes a big requirement for American-made no. boats? No, you know, it's it's, it's probably fifty-fifty. Uh, some of the owners carry guns, some don't. Um, one of our clients has got a federal firearm license and he has bazookas and machine guns and everything. What's a federal firearm license? A, FFA, a federal, a FFL, federal firearm license. If you want to, everybody thinks you, you know, if you listen to the, some of the press, you and I can go down the street and go buy a machine gun and shoot up everybody. With the magazine with 3,000 rounds. Exactly, trials. and you can't, okay. Gun show loophole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just any, you know, I'm sure there's tons of them at the NRA right now. Um, but if, you, if you're a federally licensed firearms dealer, you can get a machine gun. Going back to the yachts, about half the yacht owners yeah, would sorry. carry would carry arms, and half wouldn't. And um, the ones that carried it, it was a lot of paperwork and everything. But like one owner said, it wasn't a problem. He says I did all my paperwork and I think it was fine. And um, the other owners and some captains they said absolutely, I don't want to deal with any any arms or anything, and that's fine. I went on the yacht where the owner was a, had a federal firearm license and he's got a brand new shotgun in a box laying on the, uh, on the bridge. And I said, well, what are you doing with that? He says, oh, that's my bribe gun. Said, what are you bri what, who are you bribing and what? He says, oh, we go in these areas and, you know, and we declare that we have a gun on board. So they come on board and they, okay, you, you, where, where's this gun? Well, it's right there. It's brand new. I just bought it for this trip, but I didn't know that Costa Rica, Panama, pick a, pick a, I didn't know y'all had laws against this gun. So if, if, you know, just take it, take, I don't need it. You know, take it. This is a safe country. He said, they never looked for all the other stuff we have on board. <laughs> I said, well, how many of these do you have? He said, I've got 10. I've got 10 of these. <laughs> and that was his bribe gun. And he would give him a brand new Mossberg shotgun. He says, yeah, I get these for $300. No big deal. <laughs> and he says, and they don't look for anything else. Blimey. But he, did, he didn't have safes on board. He had areas that were lined in lead and some other stuff where they, they couldn't you know, the metal detective wouldn't pick it up, that, you know, and he would You're have... giving secrets away here now. No, How do I, I didn't give you, I think they'd give you the name of the boat. So oh, true, 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 true. You got 62 to go look for, okay? <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> it's been... I, I, I genuinely think you've probably got more stories than most in this industry. Well, it's just I've been around longer, that's all, you know, so... Yeah. Uh, and, so and that's what, you know, and at the end of the day, that's what's so... You know, interesting about the industry. First of all, you know, I love I love boating, whether it's sailing, fishing, cruising, doesn't matter. I love building them. I just love boats. But the people you meet in the industry are so interesting. Yeah. You know, the the idea that I, you know, would meet you know the royals in Dubai, you know, and be able to go fishing with them. I mean, you know, some kid from <laughs> Louisiana, well, you know, but the common denominator was they loved to the fish, and yeah. then they ended up buying some Trinities, but. It was the, it was the boating aspect, you know, when I when they invited me fishing and I um, was interested in how they fish because the captain said they fish with hand lines. I said, how do you fish for tuna fish with hand lines? And they do. They do. So um, I was fascinated. I couldn't wait to get invited. And the captain told his owner, you know, the American will go. He, he wants to see how y'all fish. 
So they were, they were all excited because I was interested in their culture, you know, being from America. And, uh, they are a fishing and, culture, aren't they? Yeah, and so I just said, no, I can, I can fish with Rod and Reel back in the U.S. I want to say a y'all fish. So then not only did we do the hand lining for tuna and everything, but they, they, they showed me how they would salt their fish because just 50 years ago they had no ice. You know, I mean, so they would they they would show me how they preserved the fish, and it was yeah. fascinating. And then that kind of that 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 whole thing just um, developed into a very good relationship with with um, about five uh, royals in Dubai, and um, never we never had any issues building their boats, warranty or anything. It was it's been very very interesting. In fact, I just talked to one two days ago uh, on a different subject, but it was. It was fascinating, you know, but the common bond was boating and yeah. fishing. Somebody said that the other day, actually. You can be on a boat, and you can be a prince, you can be a... Da -da 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 -da. The one thing that binds you. Absolutely. It's great. Yeah. It, it's, and it's universal. You can go anywhere in the world. And, and, you know, I walk boat shows and harbors because I don't care where you're in the world. You will always see something that you think, boy, that's a huge mistake. We've got to make sure we don't do that. Or... That is absolutely ingenious, mm. you know. And now it's even easier with your iPhone. Just take a picture or a video of it. And um, we don't steal any <laughs> ideas, but we do a lot of market research. <laughs> really, thank you. All right, man. Thank you. Oh.